Hello everyone, this is Dr. Stefan. Welcome to another video. In this one, I'd like to discuss about the use of a reliever inhalers such as Ventolin or blue inhalers and why sometimes when you use them a lot it may be actually a sign that something's not really under control. And I'm gonna try and refer to some of the comments that I received so I'll show you in a second uh, but just before I do that just remember that I'm not trying to provide you with direct medical advice for your care I'm just trying to kind of um, get you to see maybe the perspective from the medical side of things, how I would approach these situations and maybe try to give you a slightly different perspective. So I'll show you the comment now and then uh, we can read it together and then try and, and go from there. So so La Luna, um, sometimes I don't see the exact names in the back uh, background of YouTube, but basically I'd like to start with the second comment. So it's from the same person. So I felt like a pharmaceutical junkie on Ventolin. So the blue inhaler, um, like clockwork every three, four hours, I would need to use it. Okay. And then this is kind of maybe follow up to this comment. So I've just about tried every fancy new steroid pump inhaler containing corticosteroids. I can go back to that in a second. They don't really work because they don't fix the problem and create a dependency on the pump. Okay, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, I tried not using the steroid inhaler for five years and just use Ventolin for relief every three to four hours, which also isn't healthy. I agree, but we'll talk about that in more detail. I'm back on the steroid inhalers. Purely my opinion, the pumps or inhalers are not meant to heal the lungs at all, but rather to create a lifetime dependency on the pumps, on the inhalers. It sucks though, because other than my lungs, I have no illnesses. So yeah, so obviously this is a massive frustration and I do get it, I do get it. I do get that there is a lot of frustration when you have a respiratory disease that you need to control with all kinds of inhalers and pumps. And, you know, uh, I like the way that this person is using the word pumps because obviously it highlights, this is my, my reading between the lines, it's a way of expressing frustration perhaps. And yeah, I, I mean, I, I do get it. You're trying to, to use all kinds of devices to try to keep your lungs going well, uh, to not be breathless, to not affect your quality of life. And I, I have a feeling in this situation, the underlying condition is probably asthma. This is um, what I'm guessing based on these comments. Now, Let's talk a little bit about how we use inhalers in asthma and whether we can call it a dependency or something else or an addiction or something else. So, so first of all, a condition like asthma is actually driven by inflammation in the airways. Now, what's causing the inflammation, that is a matter of significant discussion because it can be triggered by allergies. It can be a genetic predisposition. A lot of families have many asthmatics in the same family. So you would have, you know, brothers, parents, etc., who also had asthma. So there is obviously some kind of a predisposition that may be driving people to get asthma. Now, regardless of the cause of the asthma, whether it's, you know, a predisposition, it's an allergy, it's occupational, it's linked to maybe something at work, something at home, uh, some, some environmental exposures, whatever causes that initial allergic inflammation or inflammation in the airways and little tubes that go towards the bottom of the lungs. Um, as long as that inflammation is florid, it's ongoing, it will probably lead to the little muscles around the small airways in the lungs to spasm. Sometimes, especially when you're exposed to more of the irritant that's that's been causing that inflammation. So, for instance, if you are maybe severely allergic to pollens or something like that, and it's pollen season, probably your asthma would get worse because you're just inhaling more of that that's triggering that ongoing inflammation. So, while that is happening, while that inflammation is there in the airways, and the airways are the inner lining of the airway is thickened, it's, um, you know, inflamed, oozing a little bit of fluid, it will spasm at the minimal exposure to an irritant, you can imagine that the breathing will not be great. And what the Ventolin inhaler or the Salbutamol inhaler, the blue inhaler does, so just kind of going back to this, this one, uh, what it does is it basically relaxes the little muscles, the small muscles around the airway, so it just opens it up a bit more. But it's still inflamed. So it's still that ongoing process is there. So absolutely what the person has said here, um, every three to four hours you'd need to use it. That's just because that type of inhaler, that's how long it lasts. So the effect, the pharmaceutical effect of the Ventolin inhaler is usually for about four hours. So after that, you know, it starts to wear off and that muscle tends to go back, but the inflammation is still there. So there's still a limited 
um, amount of space to breathe in and out. So obviously that will cause the asthma to kind of go and cause the symptoms again. So you would then probably have chest tightness, you start to cough, you know, all the symptoms of an asthma um, attack. And then if you have, for instance, uh, a situation where you get a viral infection and you get more inflammation because of that virus, you can imagine that that airway is really tight. So breathing can be quite difficult. So this is where this other comment comes into play. So I'm just trying to kind of work through this comment to explain my perspective from, you know, the medical side, if I can. And hopefully this is helpful. So when you're using steroid inhalers, so corticosteroid inhalers, so steroid is a term that I think is a little bit misleading, especially in the field of respiratory disease, because we are using corticosteroids. So this is a type of a steroid um, medication that tends to reduce inflammation. It acts as an anti-inflammatory medication. And what we're trying to do is that we're trying to inhale that medication in the lungs through the inhaler. So inhalers are actually quite safe medications for that reason, for safe type of treatments for that reason, because the device allows you to inhale the medication where it's needed, in the airways, where you have that inflammation. So you inhale it inside the airway, the inner lining of the airway is the one that's inflamed. So the medication really acts locally, and that allows us to use very low doses. So that prevents you from getting a lot of other side effects from the corticosteroids that you would otherwise have to ingest potentially as a tablet, tablet dissolves in the stomach, circulates to the bloodstream, then eventually gets to the airway. So uh, you can imagine the design, the concept, the idea of having um, corticosteroid inhalers has actually revolutionized the field of asthma treatment that has really improved outcomes significantly for people who have been struggling with this for years. So you can imagine if you have someone who needs to use an inhaler such as Ventolin every three to four hours just to be able to breathe. You can imagine that the activities of daily living, you know, just living life would be very difficult because you would be tied, as the, the comment says, you'd feel like a junkie because you'd have to use that inhaler all the time just to breathe. So, so obviously I completely get that frustration, but this is where these other uh, corticosteroid inhalers come, come through. So there is a lot of misconception about, uh, like I said, the safety of corticosteroid inhalers. And like I said, they're generally quite safe because the dose that we use is very low. So we're using much less, much less. So for instance, uh, a tablet of prednisolone, standard prednisolone tablet, and we usually in a NASMA flare-up might take six of those tablets or eight. So that's a dose of 40 milligrams. So each tablet has five milligrams. That's a standard prednisolone tablet. And we give these sometimes in asthma flare-ups. So that's a lot, right? 40 milligrams to take. But an inhaler dose is sometimes it's under a milligram. It's much less than a milligram. It's usually each dose has maybe a tenth or two tenths of a milligram in each dose. So it's much, much less when you inhale it directly there. So it's we can use those low doses because they can act locally. So we don't need that tablet to dissolve throughout the system and reduce inflammation in general throughout the body. We're just trying to target the airways. And when we use those corticosteroid inhalers regularly, it actually helps us to reduce some of the inflammation on the inner lining and keep it under control. Now, the problem is we're not curing the cause of asthma and that is something that is a little bit of a holy grail in medicine if you know we're not there yet there are however some disease modifying asthma drugs that have started to come on the market that can target certain cells such as the eosinophils they can target some products of some allergic um antibodies, some allergic proteins, such as immunoglobulin E. So there are some of these medications that can be given sometimes as an injection, you know, every few weeks or something like that, that can control the asthma better. But actually, the trigger may be harder to eliminate. So we're stuck in this rock between this rock and a hard place because we, we're really having to control the inflammation but we cannot remove the cause because it's just a common disease. So asthma affects hundreds of millions of people around the world. It's a very common disease. So you can imagine if we just magically found a way to, to get rid of the cause, you know, we would make a lot of people very, very happy, as you can imagine. 
but we're not there yet. So we're stuck in this situation where we're trying to control the inflammation, either with corticosteroids or some other medications that keep that inflammation under control. And that's the controller therapy. So that's the stuff that we have to take regularly. So just going back to the comment a little bit. So you know, the, the person who's writing this comment has said that they've tried not using the, the steroid inhalers for five years and just used the, the Ventolin for relief, which is also isn't healthy. So I, I agree with this comment. So I'm pretty sure the person who's made this comment just expressed a lot of frustration because it, it is unfortunately a difficult scenario because if you're letting that inflammation run wild in the airways and you're not controlling the asthma, besides having the symptoms that can be really bothersome, you can eventually down the line develop what is called fixed airway obstruction. So at the beginning, the asthma can be quite variable. So the airways can close up, open, close, open. But at some point, because of that inflammation, you might develop some mild scar tissue within the airways and then you would have a permanent blockage. And even the Ventolin wouldn't help that much at that point. So this is where I think we're just at a stage where we're trying our best with the medications that we have. And there's loads of research going on. So hopefully in the next few years, we'll have better and better treatments, like I said. So from the moment when I started, just to tell you this as a, as a plug. So, so since I've started training in respiratory disease, um, this was about 20, 12, 2013 until now. So there have been so many changes in asthma therapy. And it's sometimes really hard to keep up even for us as clinicians because they change all the time. So we started off with having just a handful of inhalers that we could prescribe. Now there's dozens of options of inhalers, different devices that work from different people just to have better controller medication that works, you know, that's easier to administer, that's easier to carry around. So we have these uh, advances. And then, like I told you about these medications that target different pathways that are involved in the allergic response that drives asthma. So those actually can control the, the inflammation with very infrequent administration. So if you're having, like I said, one of these targeted therapies, if you're eligible for it and you're getting it every few weeks, you can imagine that that requires much less medication in general. You might require less of the inhalers. And... I think this was just a comment overall. I'm not sure if this was helpful, but I tried to kind of go through some of the things that have been mentioned in this comment, because I think it's not necessarily an addiction. I think this was the gist of the comment, that it feels like an addiction, but it's not. It's actually medication that you need to take. And unfortunately, we could blame the medication. We could blame the pharmaceutical industry for it. But at the end of the day, there have been advances done by having these medications that before were... For a little struggle. So if if you think about it, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, someone who would have been diagnosed with asthma would have maybe had a Ventolin inhaler and it would just be something they, they would need all the time. And before the Ventolin inhaler, we would have nothing really. We would struggle with all kinds of therapies. I won't go into it now, but you can look it up if you want about the history of asthma treat treatments. And it was horrible. It was a horrible situation. The medications that we had had significant side effects. It was, we didn't have the good devices, the good inhalers. So I think there's been progress, but it's frustrating that we're not yet there, especially if someone mentions that they don't have any other illnesses. We're just having to rely on the inhalers just to, to have a, a decent you know, life. So this was probably a comment from the medical side, just to, to give you bit of perspective of how I think about things, how, you know, many doctors will probably think about things, not as a, a way to get you hooked on treatments, but just to try and provide you treatments that even though they may not cure the asthma completely, they might make it a little bit more manageable so you can do more. Hopefully that was helpful. If you have further questions, leave them in the comment section below. I'll see you in future videos. All the best and good health.